We have a lot of folks that are on vacation again this week and, and out for various reasons. So we just want to say good morning to all of you that are watching online and trust that you'll be blessed and ministered to as the Word of God goes forth. Let's dismiss the faith kids at this time. And if anybody would like, you can get closer. Uh, you know, just move around. I want to encourage you to take some notes today because it's so vital what the Spirit of God is saying. Right in these last days, it is so important that we hear what the Spirit of God is saying, that we really grasp and get revelation of everything that God is saying to us. Hallelujah. Now, um, in, my, in the way of opening it up this morning, you know, I want, I want to say this. Recently, I have realized that a lot of good people, everybody say a lot of good people. And I'm talking about people that were saved, okay? I'm talking about people that loved God, people that were born again, loved the Lord. A lot of people, uh, they didn't have, and some that are still living, don't have what it takes to overcome when they're attacked by the devil, my own brother being one of them, okay? And so, you know, I, I, I'm thankful that my brother Glenn is with the Lord. I, I'm thankful for that, Okay? But at the same time, I'm not going to be one of those people just out of, you know, uh, religiosity. You know, you know, well, God took him. That's what the, the, the minister, his pastor said at, at the graveside service. I know y'all think that COVID took Glenn, but the Lord took him. COVID didn't take him, the Lord took him. No, God didn't take him. 59 years old. See, the problem is that pastor doesn't know the word. He loves God. He's a good man, but he doesn't know the word. If he knew the word, he would have never made a statement like that, that God took him. Where does that come from? You know, people, because they don't take the time to study, they just repeat what they heard somebody else say. So he probably heard somebody quote out of Job, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Well, if you go back and study, you'll find out that the Lord didn't take away. Yeah, God gave Job what he had, but he didn't take away what he had. The devil took away what he had. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, right? The Bible says that Satan, he's a devourer. He goes to and fro in the earth, seeking whom he may devour. The Bible tells us that God says, with long life will I show him. Talking about people that call upon the Lord, trust in God. I'll show him my salvation with long life. Amen? There's a lot of people, folks, that have been robbed of many of the blessings of God, not just long life. I'm talking about divine healing and health and wisdom and blessing and victory. You know, and we tell people all the time, you know, you got to put on the whole armor of God. You got to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You got to stand on the promises of God. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, right? How many times have, have you heard me, not just other ministers, just me say things like that? And that on top of that, my wife and Brother Milton and Josh and Tracy Harris and on and on it goes. We've heard these things. So listen to me. Not only do I know people who have died before their time, there's a lot of folks defeated in their marriage, they're defeated in their finances. Others are losing the battle of the mind. Some are struggling to overcome physical problems in their bodies. And here's what I believe the Spirit of God is saying. I know he said this to me, and I know he wants you to get this, okay? Here's what he, he said. A lot of my people are stuck and don't know how to move forward. A lot of, God said a lot of my people are stuck, and they don't know how to move forward. Well, my desire and my responsibility as a pastor is to help you get unstuck and to help you move forward. I grew up in the South Georgia where there's clay everywhere. And those dirt roads, when it come heavy rains, that clay, I'm telling you, if you get stuck in that, it took a lot of help to get you out. I mean, literally, there were times when we got stuck in that, those roads, all four tires are sunk as far down as they can go, and the bottom of the vehicle is sitting on the ground. It takes a lot of power to get it out. Okay? Now, if you're stuck, I want you to listen real close to, to me this morning, okay? Go with me to 2 Corinthians 4.13. Huh? Yeah, this is my series. I'm sorry. The Spirit of Faith. We're talking about the Spirit of Faith. This is part 7. 
the spirit of faith, part seven. Our text, sometimes I need some help. Our text is taken from 2 Corinthians 4.13. We have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. David said, I believe, therefore I spoke. Paul's quoting David, right? Now, we'll touch more on that in a little bit. But right now, I want you to go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and let's read the first three verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, the first three verses. Paul had just talked to them about all the persecution and the struggles that he had endured and that others who, that were believers in that day, the struggles they were going through, the persecution they were facing, the uh, resistance to the gospel of Christ. And he writes to them, he said, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Keep going. And sent Timothy, our brother, minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. That word comfort is also translated encouraged, to encourage you concerning your faith. For anyone who has faced a test and trial, struggling in any way, I don't care if it's a spiritual attack, a mental attack, physical, financial, on your family, I want to encourage you concerning your faith this morning. Notice this next verse. He said that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Afflictions is talking about problems, pressures, tribulations, attacks. He says, I don't want you to be moved by any of these things. Amen? The righteous man, Psalm 112 says, is not moved. He's not moved when bad news comes, right? When things come to you contrary to God's word, you've got to learn, I will not be moved. Smith Wigglesworth would say, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm not moved by what I hear. Amen. That word moved right there in the original Greek, listen to me, I want y'all to get this. You might want to write this down in your Bible somewhere because this is so, so important that you get this. Paul was always praying exceedingly. Go to verse 10, as a matter of fact, before I go any further because I want y'all to get this. In verse 10, he said he was praying exceedingly for them. Everybody see this? That we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. That which is lacking in your faith. Listen to the, these other translations. The CEV says, and help you to have an even stronger faith. The NCV, and give you all the things you need to make your faith strong. Amplified Classic. To men and to make good what may be imperfect and lacking in your faith. So undoubtedly, folks, there were some people who were stuck. Even back then, there were some people who were stuck because of the things they were going through. The tests, the trials, the affliction, the persecution. They were stuck. And Paul was concerned about their faith. He didn't want them to be moved. You know, Brother Kenneth Hagin, my spiritual father, whom the Lord Jesus appeared to several times and told him, go and teach my people faith. One time, Brother Hagin was going through a test, a trial in his life, and nothing was happening. And he went to the Lord about it. And the Lord said, it's because you don't believe. Now listen to what Brother Hagin said. He said, Lord, he said, I do believe. And Jesus said, I know you believe as far as you know. Another time, Brother Hagin said, I would be concerned if my faith was not increasing. He said, I would be concerned, and you should be concerned, if your faith is not as increasing. If your faith is where it was the day you get sa got saved, you should be concerned. If your faith is where it was this time last year, you should be concerned. Because your faith should be ever increasing, Amen. always increasing, Amen. abounding, growing stronger and stronger and stronger. And my desire, like the Apostle Paul, is to give you the necessary tools to make your faith stronger, to mend. Whatever's missing, whatever's lacking in your faith, I want to help you to get unstuck, Okay. We were singing this morning, one of the songs mentioned breakthrough. But listen to me, folks. Every breakthrough 
comes from a breakthrough in revelation knowledge. Every breakthrough comes from a breakthrough in revelation knowledge. If you don't get revelation knowledge on the subject in which you're having to deal with right now, you're never going to get the breakthrough that you need. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you all something. Uh, you ever heard of people being locked up with possession with intent to sell? Huh? Well, I'm in possession of something with intent to distribute. I'm not to sell it. I'm going to give it away free. Amen. I'm telling y'all right now, the revelation that God has given me, I want you to have it. That's the reason I've been saying for the last two or three weeks, whatever's on this house, God wants it to be on your house. He wants it to be in your house. If I have revelation of divine healing, God wants you to have revelation of divine healing. If I have revelation of living in victory every day, he wants you to have revelation of living in victory every day. If I have revelation of divine wealth and increase, he wants you to have it. That's the reason we teach these things. Amen? I read a story recently, true story now. Matter of fact, I know the minister that told this story. He said, uh, when I was a little boy, I had a pony. And he said that pony was always getting out, you know, and somebody would call me and mom and dad say, you know, go over to so-and-so's house. Ponies over there in their patch, you know, eating their vegetables or whatever, fruit and stuff. So he said, I'd go get the pony and I'd bring him home. But one day he said, he disappeared. We couldn't find him. We looked, we looked, and we looked. We looked all over the neighborhood. We rode around, could not find him. Two weeks passed. Finally, his dad put a little ad in a local paper. Somebody called and said, uh, that, that pony you're looking for, I believe he's over here at my house. Two weeks now, and it was five miles away. He said, my dad took me over there and uh, told me to get on the pony and ride him home. Didn't have a trailer, no way to haul him. He said, told me to ride him home. And he said, we got, he said, everything was going fine until we got to this bridge. He said, as soon as we got to this bridge and the pony set his foot on that, and he heard that loud clop it made when he set foot on that bridge, he backed up. He started backing up. He said, I did everything I could. I pulled, I snatched, and a lot of other things. He said, I could not get that pony to step on that bridge. Finally, he had to find a phone, call his dad. His dad had to get some help, come get the pony and take him on home. Well, he said, years later, I was a grown man, and I was on vacation, and I was on a trail ride. And he said, you know, we're just riding around through there, and he said, I looked up front, and there's the trail guide, you know, big old fella sitting on this big old horse. And he said, so I trotted up there beside him. He said, I got to thinking about that pony when I was a boy. And he asked him, he said, uh, you ever had a horse to stop, wouldn't cross a bridge? Yep. He said, do you know why? He said, nope. He said, he wasn't very talkative. He said, finally, I said, uh, does anybody know why a horse sometimes won't cross a bridge? He said, nobody knows. He said, have you ever had it to happen? He said, yep. Well, what did you do? You might want to write this down just in case you need to go back and think about this, okay? He said, how did you get that horse to cross that bridge? He said, we tied them to an old horse that already crossed that bridge before. We tie them to an old horse, okay? Now, I'm going to put it like this. Some of y'all need to get tied to an older horse. Not old. I'm not old, but I'm older than a lot of you, okay? You need to get tied to a horse that's already been that way before. You need to get tied to somebody who's already broke barriers in the area that you need to have a breakthrough. Amen? Because everybody comes to bridges in their lives. There's times, listen to me, when you're tempted to get stuck. And a lot of people, they do get stuck. And they stay stuck for years and years, many for the rest of their life. Listen to me, folks. The devil wants you to back off. He wants you to back off of your faith. He wants you to back off of what you are believing for. If he can get you to back off one thing, and then he'll get you to back off of something else. Amen? And not only that, if he can get you to back off, now he knows what it takes to get you to back off. And he'll use it over and over and over. Why do you think that God said over in Hebrews 6, 12, I believe it is, follow those. Let's put that up for everybody to say. I think it's Hebrews 6, 12. Follow those. He said, don't be slothful, don't be lazy, spiritually lazy, but followers of those who through faith and patience 
inherit the promises. The promises of God are for you. They are yours. They belong to you. They are yes and amen in Christ. Every promise of God, God says yes. God says amen. God says so be it. And you've got to add your so be it to it. Amen. You've got to add your amen to God's amen. He wants you to have the promises. The Tree of Life translation says, Imitators of those inheriting the promises through trust and perseverance. What is perseverance? Perseverance literally means persistence in doing something despite difficulty, failure, or opposition. Now let me ask y'all something. Do you think that David ever faced difficulty, failure, opposition? Do you think Abraham faced those things? Do you think the Apostle Paul faced those things? They all did, right? But yet, the same chapter, if you go to verse 15, tells us that after he patiently endured, Abraham obtained the promise. After he patiently endured. Through faith and patience. Patience is endurance. Perseverance. Sticking with it. Staying with it. Not backing up. Not backing off. Amen? It's important you, you hear what I'm saying to you, okay? Now remember what Paul said. He said, just like David, who had the spirit of faith, just like David, who said, I believe, therefore I spoke, he said, we have that same spirit of faith. Therefore, we believe. What do you believe? In your heart. You don't believe in your head. You believe in your heart. Faith is of the heart. He said, we believe, therefore we speak. Now, Paul talked a lot about Abraham. Paul talked a lot about David. As a matter of fact, he talked about Abraham in 2 Corinthians. He talked about him in Galatians, in the book of Hebrews, and Romans. Why am I telling you this? Because sometimes you've got to get tied to an old horse. An older one who's gone places that you haven't. Amen. Now look, we've been to Hebrews 10 and 35. Hebrews 10 and 35. The Bible tells us, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence, okay? That word confidence in the Greek is parousia, and it literally means boldness or courage, all outspokenness. The complete Jewish Bible says, don't throw away that courage of yours. The Passion Translation says, don't lose your bold, courageous faith, for you are destined for a great reward. Listen to me, folks. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. To obtain the promises of God, you must fight the good fight of faith, and it takes courage to do it. I said it takes courage to do it. Oh, this is not for the faint-hearted. I'm telling you right now, the, the walk of faith, to live by faith, to walk by faith, it is not for the faint-hearted. Or, or the lazy. That's exactly right. Men press into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. The violent, one translation says, they, they are stormtroopers that take it by force. Amen. Amen? In other words, you, you just make up your mind, I'm going to have the promises of God. I'm going to have the blessings of God. It's not a matter of whether God wants me to have it or not. It's not a matter of me waiting for God to do it because like my wife said earlier, the Lord has already done, already is going to do about your salvation, about your healing, about your deliverance, about your victory. His victory is our victory. It's ours. It's a simple matter of taking what belongs to you? The good fight of faith is not about trying to get God to give you something. It's all about resisting the devil who's trying to take away from you what is yours. He doesn't want you to have divine help. He doesn't want you to prosper financially. He doesn't want you, the devil doesn't want you to have peace of mind. He doesn't want you to have joy in your heart. Amen? No, he wants to defeat you. So you've got to make up your mind. I'm going to be like David. I'm going to be like Abraham. I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul. Think about it. A few of the things that David faced, a lion, a bear, a giant, brothers that were critical of him, a wife that was full of pride, a king that was jealous of him and tried to kill him, that's just a few of the things that David faced, right? But yet we know that David died a good old age full. The Bible says he, he was full of help, 
I mean, full of wealth. He was full of wisdom. I mean, listen to me, folks. He lived a long, good, full life. In the face of all of that opposition. I don't know about y'all, but I have the spirit of faith. The Bible says we have in the same spirit of faith. Glory to God. You may want to jot this down. Because you're going to need to meditate on this some. Especially in the face of difficulties. There are times that God gives us grace to live opposite of the promise. There are times that God gives us grace to live opposite of the promise. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, think about it. Joseph had a dream at 17. It did not come to pass until he was 30 years old. Joseph went from the pit to the prison to the palace in 13 years. God gave him the grace to live opposite of the promise that God had given him that one day he would reign as a king. Listen, David was somewhere between 16 and 19 when he was ordained to be the king of Israel, but he was 30 years old before he sat on the throne. But yet God gave him the grace to live opposite of the promise. In other words, when it looked like the promise was not going to come true, God gives us the grace to keep on standing, to keep on pressing, to still have victory in our lives, no matter what it looks like in the natural. Every one of these people of faith, you will find that to be the case. Amen? Because, listen, just because the promise hasn't manifested doesn't make it any less real. It doesn't make it any less obtainable to those who walk by faith. Amen? I, I think about Abraham and Sarah. He was 75, she was 65 when God first appeared to them. And God made him a promise to make his name great, to bless him. He promised him a child. Do you know that it was 25 years before that child was born? The child that was given by promise, Isaac, listen to me, did not come until he was 100 years old and she was 90. Isn't that amazing? Now, the Bible says, cast not away your confidence. Going back to Hebrews 10, verse 38. Now, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. What does that mean, to live by faith? It's the, it, it implies a way of life. It did not say the just shall live by faith at church. <laughs> Jesus did not say, and shall believe that he, what he says to come to pass, he shall have what he saith at church. That's not what Jesus said. If everybody had what they said at church, we'd all be fine. Because at church we confess, I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, I have victory, amen. I'm delivered, I'm blessed, I'm prosperous, everything I put my hand to prospers, and we go out there. See, out there is where it counts. So the just shall live. In other words, this is a way of life. This is not something we just do on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. This is something we do every moment of every day, 24-7, amen. Amen. Brother Mark Hankins said that when he was a young man, that he and his wife, he shared this this week while I was at this, this, this special meeting. When he was a young man, he had gotten born again. You know, well, he got saved when he was a kid, just wasn't living right, backslid. Y'all heard him tell about it when he was here. The deacons had just got him out of jail when he was 17. Brother Hagin came to the church. And he made, it, made his mind up. He said, I'm, I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn. I'm going to start listening. He, and he said this is when he first, he really got serious about God. Well, as he got older, he was called into the ministry. He, him and Trino got married, you know, and uh, he was tithing. And then he increased it. They, they, they went from tithing 10% to tithing and giving another 10. Then they went from tithing the, the 10% and giving another 20 Now he said, we're at 30% giving. He said, well, you know, I'm in the ministry and getting started good. Now his dad... Now, most of y'all probably don't even know anything about his dad, but I've been knowing his dad been going to be the Lord for a long time. But when I was just a young man getting started in the walk of faith, I used to hear Brother Hagin and others talk about B.B. Hankins a lot. I mean, B.B. Hankins was in a small town and built a very large church and built other churches in other places as well. A great man of faith. And so Brother Mark said, we were struggling financially. 
He said, so I went to my dad, and I asked him, he said, because things are tight, and I asked him, can I back off of my giving? And his dad said this, if the devil can make you back off of that, in that area, where will he attack you next? Think about it now. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3. There was something I wanted to tell y'all. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3. Now, in the face of all these opposition and persecution that the church at Thessalonica was going through, Paul was concerned about their faith. He wanted to perfect their faith. He wanted to encourage them in their faith. And he did not want them to be moved by those afflictions. That word moved right there, this is, I love this. Oh, this is so good. I shared this several years ago, and the Holy Ghost reminded me of it last night. It's the Greek word, saino, and it means to wag the tail. That word moved in the Greek means to wag the tail. To wag the tail. Now, I grew up, we always had lots of dogs, okay? How many know that different dogs are like people that have different personalities? And dogs respond to you according to to how you speak to them and how you treat them, right? In other words, if you got one of these dogs and every day as soon as you, you know, get out of your car, they come running up and you pat him and, you know, hey, boy. I mean, he's just wagging that tail. He's excited. He's jumping around, you know. But then he scratches your car. And you say, get out of here. What does he do? Tail goes between his legs. He says, I don't want you to be moved like a dog who wags his tail based on the circumstances, right? No, no, no. God doesn't want you up on the mountain one day, down in the valley the next day. No, no. He doesn't want you living that way. He wants you, no matter what, do not be moved by these things. And begin to say, none of those things move me. None of these things move me. Nothing that's happening in America moves me. Nothing that's happened with COVID moves me. Nothing that happened in Washington, D.C. moves me. It's not going to move me off my faith. Amen. God's still on the throne, and I'm still seated with Jesus at his right hand. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, the world to come. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Amen. Now, Hebrews 11 talks about the people who accomplish great things by faith. You know what it, how it reads over and over. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, through faith, by faith, by faith. It's over and over and over. Look at this in Hebrews 11, verse 33. Because now he, the writer begins to talk about, listen, I don't have time to tell you about all the rest of the people who did great things through faith, who through faith subdued kingdoms, yeah. subdued kingdoms. Yeah. America is a kingdom. Yeah. I don't know if y'all know this or not. Okay? Daniel changed the nation. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego changed the nation. Ob watch this. Wrought righteousness, obtained promises. Let's stop right there. I want to really focus on that where it says wrought righteousness. What does that mean? The New Living Testament says ruled with justice. We're talking about people who through faith Ruled with justice. The MIT administered justice. God's Word translation. Did what God approved. The ESV says enforced justice. In other words, they made things right that were wrong. Through their faith, they set things in order. Through your faith, you can set things in order that are out of order. Put uh, Hebrews 11.3 in the Amplified Classic up for everybody to see. I want you all to see this. Through faith, by faith, and through faith, we understand the world were framed by the Word of God, right? Yeah. But what does that all mean? We're in Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand the world during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for the intended purpose. How? By the Word of God. So that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. You've got to use your faith to bring the unseen into the seen. You've got to use your faith to set things in order that are out of order. 
There are people all through the Bible who through faith, they wrought righteousness. They made things right. They administered justice. Have you ever felt like that you were treated unfairly? Have you ever felt like that things that were happening in your life, it just wasn't right? Well, use your faith and make it right. Are y'all hearing me? Years and years ago, while we were still in Georgia, I was working for the Macon Telegraph newspaper. I had gone into the office, had to go into the office once in a week. The rest of the time I was out in the... It already uh, was getting dark. I pull up to a, a light. I look up. The light's red. I look left. Nothing's coming. And you can turn right on red if nothing's coming. Now, as soon as I turned and got down the street a little bit, here comes a blue light. Officer pulls me over, and I roll my window down, and he walks up to the car, asks for my license. I said, uh, Officer, why did you pull me over? He said, because you turned right on that red light. I said, yes, I did, but nothing was coming. And he said, well, there's a sign that says no right turn on red. I said, I looked up. There's not a sign up there. He says, it's on the side of the road. Right before you get to the stop sign, it's on the side of the road. I said, I've never seen a sign like that on the side of the road before. They're always up there on the lot, by the lot. And he said, well, I'm going to give you a ticket. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to pay this ticket. In the name of Jesus, I will never pay this ticket. Now, I'm not being disrespectful, but that is unfair. And I tell you, by faith, I was administering justice. I was setting things right. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm telling you right now, you know as well as I do, this is not right. Everywhere I've ever been in Georgia, there's always a sign beside the light that tells you if you can't turn. I said, I've never seen one on the side of the street like, that, like you're telling me. And he said, well, I'm going to give you this ticket and you're going to have to pay. I said, no, sir, I'm not. I said, I respect you. I said, but I'm telling you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I will never pay this ticket. A couple of days later, that officer called me, and he said, uh, this Mr. Smith? And I said, yes, it is. He said, this is Officer so-and-so. I said, yes, sir. How you doing today? He said, uh, I'm doing fine. Just called to tell you that the uh, city council has changed the ordinance, and we're taking those signs down, and you can tear that ticket up. I said, thank you very much. I wanted to say, I told you so, I told you so, but I didn't. I didn't do that. All I was doing was using my faith to administer justice to set things in order, right? And you can do the same thing. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, God's Word works if, you got, if you'll work the Word. Man, I'm telling you. Folks, listen to me. We are agents of God's government in the earth. But we have to exercise our authority. We have to take dominion. And obtaining the promises of God, it takes more than faith. I'm going to say it again. Obtaining the promises of God takes more than faith through faith, follow those, listen to me, follow those who through faith and what? Patience, endurance, perseverance. It takes courage, folks. You've got to have some courage to lay hold to the promises of God. Courage is required to confront anyone or anything that contradicts the promises of God. It's going to take some courage for you to do it. Okay? See, by faith, we... We see. We get revelation knowledge. We know by faith what God has given us. We know that because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, healing, divine help, is a right to the child of God. It is ours. It's a part of our inheritance. To prosper is a divine right. Are y'all getting this? But even though by faith we see what God has given us, what belongs to us, we have to have boldness to decree it. We have to have boldness to act on that revelation to bring it to pass in our life. And a lot of people are lacking in that area. They're lacking in their faith because they don't have the boldness to decree what God says in the face of the opposition. See, a lot of people, is, they, if, if they say, well, if I'd have done that, I'd have probably waited until he drove off in, in, the, in my car by myself, and I'd have said, I'm not going to pay this ticket. Oh, Lord, I hope I don't have to pay the ticket. Lord, help me. Lord, have mercy on me. That ain't going to work. That ain't going to get nothing done. I'm just telling you right now. Amen? See, I'm just telling you, you've got to confront the problem. You've got to confront 
the situation. You've got to confront the culture itself. When the culture tells you, listen to me, like Daniel, we just made a new law, and you cannot pray to any other God. You're going to have to pray to this, this idol we made. I'm going to tell you right now. Daniel had the law changed. By his faith in God, he administered justice. He administered righteousness. He did not hide in prayer. When they passed a law that he could not pray to his God, he went to the same place that he always went to, opened windows like a balcony where people could just see him, and he's just praying. He prays at the same time every day. He doesn't change anything. Oh, yeah, they threaten his life. But guess what? Our God is able. You hear what I'm saying? David prayed anyway. If they say, well, you can't go to church, we're going to go to church anyway. Did y'all hear what I said? And if pastors around America would have took a stand, a lot of these churches that are now closed wouldn't be closed. There comes a time when you've got to be bold with your faith. Amen? It takes boldness. It takes confidence to say, I don't care what you say. I don't care how much you threaten us. I want you to know this. My God is able to deliver me, and he will deliver me. But do you have the boldness to say that? As a young Christian, I was working in a General Motors plant, and we had, you know, uniforms. Everybody wore these uniforms. They had a pocket here. I carried my New Testament with me. I never took it out on the floor. But when I would go to break, when I would eat lunch, I would take my New Testament out. A lot of times I'd sit there and read. Well, we had a supervisor that was a very ungodly, wicked man. I mean, he was full of the devil. And he came up to me one day, and he pointed. He said, you can't have that Bible out here on this floor. I said, who said so? He said, I do. I said, well, who are you? You're not my God. You're not Jesus. You're a supervisor concerning work, but you have no authority over this right here. Well, you can't have that on this floor. I said, yes, I can. I said, now, you've never seen me take it out on the floor, have you? You don't ever see me sitting there reading when I'm supposed to be working, but I keep it with me. It's my right. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm a born-again child of God. I love the Word of God. And when I go to break, when I go to lunch, that's my free time, I read. And there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, it just, whoo. I mean, you can just see the, the, the fiery darts coming out of his eyes. He did everything he could. Because I stood my ground. You know what most Christians would have done? They'd have left the Bible at home. They wouldn't have confronted the issue. Now, I can stay here all day long and tell you the time. Sometimes you've got to confront the culture. You've got to confront the problem. You've got to confront the demons that are operating through people. And you do it in love. You do it in faith. You do it with courage. You do it with boldness. I'm not going to back off. I'm not going to back down. Amen? Y'all with me so far? Y'all remember last week that I used a, the confirmation. You know, Hebrews 11, 1, the Amplified Classic says, Now, faith is the confirmation. Y'all remember that? And I, and I gave you the illustration of making a, a, a hotel reservation, you know, booking a room. Well, guess what happened to me Monday night? You know that another hurricane was coming in down there, Texas, New Orleans. And so people were flooding into the towns like the one that I went to, trying to find places to stay. The hotels were, were full. And I had called, you know, ahead of time, got my reservation. And like I told y'all, I make sure to write it down, and I have them to send it to my email on my phone. And so I walk in. Now, I've been riding all day long. I've been on the road 12, 13 hours. I'm tired. I'm ready to get in my room. And uh, I walk in, and uh, there's two ladies. One of them, she's waiting on somebody. The other one, she's standing here by herself. Couldn't find out that was her first day. So that was her first day. And so I said, ma'am, uh, I'm James E. Smith. I have a reservation. She pulled it up. She said, your reservation has been canceled. And I said, no, ma'am, it hasn't. And she said, well, it says right here that it's been canceled. I said, it hasn't been canceled. I'm James E. Smith. I didn't cancel it. I said, let me show you something. Put my phone, pulled it up. I said, you see that right there? 
That's my name, address. That is your hotel information. That is the confirmation number. See it, brother? Right confirmation number. I read it out loud. That tells me and you that I have a room at this hotel. And she said, well, just a minute. So when this other woman gets through, because she's like the boss lady, you know, she walks over, she looks at it, she says, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, your room's been canceled. I said, no, it hasn't. <laughs> and she did some more typing and looking. She said, well, there's a James Smith in that room. I said, well, I'm James Smith. I'm standing in front of you, and I'm not in that room. <laughs> she picks up the phone, and she's talking. And she hangs up, and she said, well, something happened, and the room has, your room has been given to somebody else. And we don't have any more rooms. She said, that's the reason they called you. I said, nobody called me. I said, they might have called that other James Smith. They hadn't called me. <laughs> and I said, and here's my confirmation. She thought I was going to go away. You can have confidence. I have confidence in God. I have boldness. Amen. I know my rights. And I got a room at that hotel. And I said, now, no matter what I have to do, y'all got any coffee made? If you don't, make me some coffee. But I'll sit right here until you get my room ready. <laughs> you know what that woman did? She's the boss lady now. You can tell she's the big wheel in that place. She husks. <sighs> Give me about 15 minutes. She runs to get the cleaning cart, and she takes off. About 15 minutes, she comes back. And the other little sweet little lady, I felt sorry for her. The new lady, she walks over and says, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. Here's your key. I said, thank you very much. And I went and got in my room. <laughs> now, what would you have done? That's what I want to know. What would you have done? Be serious with me right now. Be honest with me. Be honest with yourself. What would you have done? Because let me tell you something. There were no hotels in that, no other rooms in that, in that whole town. The next town over, I had called them before I called this one. They were all full. There was nowhere to stay. You've got to have some boldness. I'm telling you, it takes more than faith to obtain the promises of God. You've got to have courage to act on it. Hallelujah. Amen. Think about it, folks. God is able to deliver, and he will deliver. Some trust in horses and some in chariots. But I will remember the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Y'all remember what David told Goliath? You come against me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. The host of the armies of heaven. Hallelujah. One time Jonathan, you know, Jonathan was in covenant with David. And he had his uh, armor bearer with him. And they, they come up against a very large troop of Philistine warriors. You know what Jonathan told him? Told his, his, his armor bearer? He said, the Lord doesn't save by many or by few. Let me tell you something. God doesn't have to have a crowd to win. Are y'all getting this? You and the Lord are majority. But you're going to have to learn to use your faith. You're going to have to learn to stand. Amen? I tell you what God does, and he needs a voice. I said God needs a voice. Have y'all ever read when, John, when, when Isaiah prophesied? He prophesied about a voice. Let's, let's tell you what let's do. Let's go over to, uh, I believe it's in Isaiah 40. Y'all give me a second. I think that's where it is. Yeah, Isaiah 40, verse 3. Now, here's Isaiah the prophet. Hundreds of years before John the Baptist was ever born, right? And he prophesies in verse 3, The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight. The rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record John the Baptist and what he did. They all say John was a voice crying in the wilderness. He was a voice. God needs a voice. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? God needs a voice. Go to Psalms 29, verse 4. I don't have time to read the whole thing to you. It'd do you good just to go read the whole chapter. It's not very long, but I want to point out a few things. In verse 4, it says, the voice of the Lord is powerful. How many of you agree that the voice of the Lord is powerful, right? And I know what you want. You want God to speak to your situation. But stay with me. 
The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Verse 7. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. You remember what Paul said? And take the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I want you to say this out loud. I take the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, of the devil. Are y'all getting this? The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire, but you've got to take the shield of faith. You've got to hold up. It's not a literal shield like a warrior had in the days of David. But it is a real shield. It's a supernatural shield that you hold up with the Word of God. It's like a force field around you that protects you from the attacks of the enemy. The voice of the Lord divided the flames of fire. Watch this, verse 8. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. Verse 9, the voice of the Lord makes the hinds bring forth their young. This is Amplified Classic. And his voice strips bare the forest, while in his temple everyone is saying, Glory. Amen. Are y'all getting this now? Listen to me carefully. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. While everybody in the temple is shouting, Glory, God's shaking some things. His voice is going forth, right? Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15. Now here we have Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, God's people. They're surrounded by enemy armies, right? They're outnumbered. There is no way in the natural for them to overcome, to win in the natural. There are many, many times in the natural, it is impossible in the natural. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. And all things are possible to him that believes, right? When the doctor says it, that doesn't mean it's so. Thank God for doctors and medical science. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? You've got to put your trust in God. You've got to have some confidence in the Lord. Don't cast away your confidence in God. Have a boldness about you to act on his word, knowing that he's with you, knowing that he's for you. So the prophet rises up. They fast and they're praying. They call upon the Lord for help. The prophet stands up and says, Don't be afraid or dismayed. The battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 17. Does that mean that you do nothing? The battle is the Lord's. Listen to me. It's not yours, but that does not mean that you don't do anything. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. It's not up to you to make it happen. God's going to make it happen as long as you do your part. Through faith and patience, endurance, perseverance, with courage, with boldness, you've got to decree the Word. You've got to act on the Word of God, unafraid, knowing that your God is with you. But what if it doesn't work? What if it does work? See, that's what the devil's always saying. But what if it doesn't work? If you have confidence in Almighty God, you are trusting in Him, and you know that He is not a man that He should lie. Has He said it? Shall He not do it? God watches over His Word, folks. So now the prophet has spoken, and watch what happens. He said, you don't need to fight in this battle. Set yourself. You know what the Amplified Classic says? Take your positions. Take your positions. In other words, he didn't say, everybody just go back to your tents and take a nap. I, I'll take care of this while y'all sleeping. That's not what he said at all. He said, you take your position. Verse 20, the king said, believe in God, you'll be established. Believe the prophet and you'll prosper. You've got to follow somebody. I'm telling you, you've got to follow somebody that's walked this way. Because they'll help you get over that bridge. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you've been stuck for so long. Why do you think that God gives pastors to local congregations? Now, I'm going to have to be careful here because I know how people think. Well, who do you think you are? It's not a matter who I think I am. I know who I am. I know that 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 I know as good as I know my name. That I am born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost. God counted me faithful, put me into the ministry. The Bible says he gave gifts unto men. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. I had a vision. He called me to the ministry. 
He set us in this place for such a time as this. I know that I am a pastor. I know that. Are y'all with me now? And God gives these gifts to the body of Christ so that they can be equipped. So they can be trained. So they can be furnished in all good works. The Word of God is taught to raise you up so that you can live in victory, folks. Amen? And so, watch this now. He told them, he said, here's what you got to do. You got to get out there and you got to put your trust in God and you got to start praising Him. Somebody shout glory. glory. God shook, shakes the wilderness while everybody in the temple is shouting glory. glory. God's moving. God's moving. You with me so far? Look at verse 22. While they're praising God, what happened? The Lord set ambushments. The Lord set ambushments. The World English Bible says, Yahweh set ambushers against them. Who do you think those ambushers were? What about the angels? Are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are the heirs of salvation? Do they not, listen to me, are they not giving charge over you lest you dash your foot against a stone to keep you in all your ways? Do they not uh, surround those that fear the Lord to deliver them? These ambushers were the very army of the angels in heaven who came to fight for them. But they're praising God. Okay? Verse 24 tells us that when Judah came to the watchtower in the wilderness, the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. You got this? And when they got to there, what happened? They saw nothing but dead bodies. Nothing but dead bodies. Whose voice did the enemy hear? Did they hear God's voice? Whose voice did they hear? I said God needs a voice. Now we know his voice is powerful. His voice is majestic. His voice divides the flames of fire. It shakes the wilderness. But the Bible says, now watch this. They heard appointed singers. He appointed singers. And when I saw that appointed singers, I thought, you know what? Those appointed singers were also anointed singers. They were anointed to stand in their place to sing and to praise God. And because they were willing to sing and praise God in the face of the difficulty, in the face of death itself, God delivered them. He sent the angels to ambush the enemy. He will be an enemy to your enemy. He'll trouble those that trouble you. If you will trust him and do your part, I love the way it says in the New Testament there was a man sent from, from God. There was a man sent from God named John. A man. He wasn't a wimp. He wasn't afraid. He didn't back down from the religious Pharisees. He didn't back down from the political leaders of the day. He was bold in his faith. And like I said, we do things in love, but we do it in faith and we do it with courage. You do know that you can speak the truth in love. Right? But yet you still speak the truth. See, a lot of people think, well, if I speak the truth in love, you know, it's got to be all, you know, sissy and, you know, oh, I just love you so much. And, oh, I just wish you would be, be more, uh, just able to get along together. No, 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 no. Sometimes you've got to point your finger in somebody's face and you've got to say, my God is able. And my God will deliver. And my God will change the situation. You know, we had just got started good right here, matter of fact. Now, hardly any of you remember this because we only had a handful of people. They had legalized the, uh, what was it, gambling houses, you know, in, in South Carolina. Right down here. I'm talking about less than a half a mile. This building on the right-hand side, old run-down building there now. Somebody bought that, that building. And they was in there fixing it up. And so one day I was riding by there and I felt impressed by the Holy Spirit to stop. And I walked in. There's a bunch of men working. And I asked him, I said, uh, what are y'all what are y'all uh, going to put in here? And he said, oh, so-and-so from Lancaster bought this. And it's going to be a, you know, a poker house, one of those gambling places. Casino. Huh? Casino. Casino. And I said, oh, really? He said, yep. And uh, so I'm just standing there and a pickup pulls up. This man gets up and he's. I mean, you, you, I knew as soon as he got out of, of the truck that he had demons. 
because that demon recognized me for who I was. And boy, he was mad. As soon as he got out of the truck, why is he mad? He don't even know who I am, but that demon in him did. I'm telling you right now, we need to have a reputation in hell. Hell needs to know who we are. We need to be like it was when those men was trying to cast those demons because they were trying to copy Paul. And those demons spoke up and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? I, we don't want to be the who are you. We want to be the Jesus I know, Paul I know, Eddie I know, Milton I know, Rebecca I know. Come on now. We want to be on that list. So he just marched up there. What are you doing here? I said, well, I pastor, my name's Eddie Smith, and I pastor Faith Family Church right down the road there. And I just stopped to see what was going on here. And uh, they told me y'all were going to open a casino. That's right. And there ain't nothing anybody can do about it. I said, you don't think so? And he said, no. I said, let me tell you something. Everybody stop working. All the men stop working. I said, in the name of Jesus, this place will never open. I turned around and walked off. He's cussing. He's cussing me. Oh, he's cussing. Oh, he's mad. I just walked off, got in my car. And I came and told the church about it. We got in prayer. Are y'all hearing me? I called some of the other pastors. In this church down the road here, we had a special prayer meeting. Even the sheriff showed up. And we prayed and we came against it. And guess what happened? That man got killed. Don't touch the anointed of God. Don't touch my anointed God. Said, Don't touch him with your hand. Don't touch him with your mouth. And don't tell me I don't have authority. Don't tell this church that we don't have authority in these counties around us and in this state and in this nation. We can affect nations if we get to the place that we understand our authority and how our faith is used to change situations. Amen. Now, y'all stay with me here. They went to the wilderness, and the wilderness was shaken because the voice was coming from the people. God always has to have a voice, folks. Amen? I'm telling you, if you'll go on down, look at this. Let's read verses 25, 26. Watch this. The people came to take away the spoil. They found in abundance riches, precious jewels. They stripped them for themselves, more than they could carry away. Three days in gathering the spoil, it was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord, therefore the name of the same place was called the Valley of Barakah until this day. Anybody know what Barakah is in Hebrew? If you have different translations, some of your translations would say the Valley of Blessing. The Valley of Blessing. What was intended to be a valley of death to the people of God, God turned it around and made it a valley of blessing. Amen? So if you find yourself in the valley, turn it into a valley of blessing. Amen. Well, Pastor, I can shout on the rooftop. Well, anybody can shout on the rooftop, on the housetop, on the mountaintop. Anybody can shout then. But what about when you're in the basement? What about when you're in the valley of despair? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He said, why? Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me right in the presence of my enemy. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Why? You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Hallelujah. I'm telling y'all, many or most of God's people are living far below their privileges, far below their rights. And it's time to wake up. Well, awake to righteousness, and by faith begin to administer justice. Set things in order. Anytime God wants to change a city, a nation, it doesn't matter. He wants to change a person's life. The first thing that has to happen is he's got to get his word in somebody's mouth. He's got to get his word in their mouth. Listen to what he said to Isaiah. To Isaiah, he said, I'll put my words in your mouth that I may plant the heavens. To John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness. John was a voice. Isaiah was a voice. Right? Go to Jeremiah 1. I know i got to hurry. Y'all stick with me here. This is very, very important. In Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 6, look what God said to this man, Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew thee. 
Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet to the nation. This said I, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I am a child. And the Lord said, shut your mouth. Stop talking that doubt and unbelief. You're not too young. You're not too old. This has got nothing to do with your education level. It's got nothing to do with your political party of choice. We are one race, one nation, a holy nation, a peculiar people, the body of Christ. It doesn't matter whether you're black, white, red, polka dotted, got stripes down you. It doesn't matter to God. It doesn't matter to me. We are to love one another. We are to love this world. And we are to exercise and take dominion and set things right. It starts by setting things right in your home. Amen? He said, I ordained you a prophet. Well, I can't speak. I'm too young. I'm just a child. He was a teenager, as we call it. He said, you go where I tell you to go. You say what I tell you to say. And verse 8, don't be afraid of their faces. Y'all should stand up here sometime. Ask the praise and worship team. Now, now they get it worse than I do. Because when they get up there, y'all just start coming in. Okay? A lot of you went to bed too late last night. You didn't get enough sleep. Some of you got fusses on the way to church. You got all kinds of things on your mind. And you come in and they start trying to, you know, bring the presence of God into the place so that I can minister by the Word and by the Spirit. And you're just sitting there. Boy, them faces sometimes. Whew. Some of them are not happy faces. Y'all know that, right? There's a lot of unhappy faces in the church at times. There's a lot of faces that are filled with doubt and unbelief at times. But thank God for those happy faces. People are smiling. Amen. At least some of you come in ready. I don't think I've ever been in a service where everybody came in ready to worship God. It takes a while to get some of you cranked up. Some of y'all remind me of my, my old dad's 1957 pickup truck. You had to go ahead and start it on those cold winter days. You just get, jump in it and take off like you do now. You had to warm it up first. You had to go ahead and start it up and let it warm up a little bit. Come on, take some time to get it going. That's the way some of y'all are. Take some time to get you going. But you're going now, aren't you? Come on now. Now listen, verse 9. I want y'all to see this. The Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Lift your hand to heaven. Say, Lord, Lord. I'm asking you. Touch my mouth in Jesus' name. Look what he said. The Lord said, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Verse 10. He said, I have set thee this day over the nations, over the kingdom, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down. It's time to start throwing down, bless God. I'm talking about throw down everything that's of the devil. And to build up and to plant. He puts his word in our mouth. Because he wants to plant the heavens. He wants to plant the heaven in your life, in your mind, your body, your finances, in your marriage, in your children's life. Amen. He wants to plant the heavens. Yes. But he has to have a voice. He's got to have somebody. They're hungry, hungry. Now, y'all don't get mad with me, okay? Everybody say it out loud right now. Say it out loud. Say, Pastor. I promise not to get mad with you about what you're going to say. All right. Then y'all promise, okay? And you're not a liar, so you already promised. I was sitting in that meeting this week, and it was by invitation only by pastors around the country and other countries as well. And some of them brought the, the whole family with them. Some of them, uh, you know, were like me. Nobody could go. There were several people like myself. But there were several that were just couples, and there were some that were whole families. And I particularly watched those that we call teenagers. Now, the Bible doesn't have the word teenager in it, right? So as far as God is concerned, there is no such thing as a teenager. You get to a certain point, listen to me, at 12 years old, boys and girls, listen to me, you become a young man, a young woman. And you're supposed to be in training. I said, you're supposed to be in training. Parents, listen to me, you've already promised you're not going to get mad with me, okay? When we were training ours, they didn't see it away from us. You know why? Because I know that these kids, 
given the opportunity, they're going to sit on their phones, they're going to talk, and I watched. Now, I like to sit up close, but a couple nights, here's what I did. I wanted to watch. In the very back, last row, they had the camera set up, and they had some chairs there, and they had some chairs here, and right beside the camera was a big wooden platform. I thought, well, that's a good place to put my coffee, and I can watch things. <laughs> so I sat right there for the last two or three services. They let you bring coffee. had coffee. You know, you can make it and get up go make a new cup because services are long-lasting like this. Y'all don't understand how long these services go. And sometimes you just got to get up and walk around while they're still preaching and teaching, go get your cup of coffee, whatever. So I got my coffee, and I'm sitting, and I'm watching. And there's several families in the rows ahead of me that have their children that are anywhere from 12 to 16, 17 years old. You know what most of those, those children were doing? They were totally checked out. They were totally unengaged. You say, well, what am I going to do, pa Pastor? Well, first of all, you're going to have a talk with them. Second of all, you're going to make some changes, and you're going to begin to pray over them and plead the blood of Jesus over them, and you're going to do your best to help get God's Word in their mouth. Now, if you need more help with that, talk to Rebecca. Oh, uh, there you go again. You think, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I don't think they're perfect. I don't think my kids are perfect. I don't think my grandkids are perfect. But I tell you what, I will put them upside of anybody else's. And I say it unashamedly. Now, they don't like for me to say it because it makes some of the other kids mad at them. And then they got to hear the brunt of it. Oh, we've heard it. Oh, y'all think y'all perfect. Y'all think y'all never made a mistake. No, we don't think nothing like that. Ain't been a couple times, they knocked my kids ahead of me, I'd grab them up and slap them myself. But now we just leave it up to Joshua and Becca. Because they don't put up with no foolishness. If you put up with foolishness, you're going to have foolishness in your house. Now, if y'all want to look and see, it's not in my notes. If you don't want to go to check, it's not in my notes. I want this house filled with the glory of God, I want your house filled with the glory of God. I want you, your family, your husband, your wife, your children, everyone to have the anointing of God on your life, to walk in the blessings of God, to live in total victory. And you're not going to do it unless you get the Word of God in your mouth. you got to get it in your heart, get it in your mouth. You're never going to get it in your heart until you get it in your mouth. Did you hear what I said? The Word of faith that we preach says what? The Word of faith is in your mouth and in your heart. You're never going to get it in your heart until you get it in your mouth. People ask me, well, Pastor, I, I have a lot of ministers that call me and we'll, we'll be talking. They, they got questions to ask me about different things. You know, just being a pastor to pastors. They're having problems. And like sometimes in conversation, they'll say, well, I was listening to you. How, how did you remember so many scriptures? I said, I didn't. I have never practiced memorization except when I was in the fourth grade. <laughs> I was in the fourth grade, Mrs. Brown, who went to the Primitive Baptist Church. The pastor's name was Lord. I am not kidding y'all. L-O-R-D. Everybody called him Brother Lord. And I didn't know whether to go and bow down or run from him. I mean, Lord. Okay? And Miss Brown was my fourth grade teacher. She went to that church. We went there once every, you know, three, four months or something like that. They only had church once a month and they have dinner on the ground, you know. I like the dinner on the ground part. And one day, Miss Brown said, well, it was the first, it was the, I think it was the first week of fourth grade. And she had this big old beautiful white Bible. Big old, I thought it was the most beautiful Bible I'd ever seen in my life. And she said, now here's what we're going to do. She said, I'm going to give y'all verses, Bible verses. And the person that, and she said her time. And she said, the person that remembers, uh, memorizes the most Bible verses, you're going to win this Bible. And guess what? I won that Bible. That's the only time I ever practiced it. And I went to recess and somebody stole it. So I had it for about 10 minutes. Isn't that crazy? Well, may they read it and get saved and go to heaven. Amen. We're going to bless and not curse. Hallelujah. But see, other than that, all I've done is studied and confess the word. Study and confess the word. Study and confess the word. Study and confess the word. 
Over and over and over and over. I told y'all that word lego there in Mark 11, 23, it is a set discourse. It's a set way of talking. I mean, it is the way you talk all the time. It's a way of life. You don't talk this way just on Sunday morning. You talk this way at work. If somebody tries to tell you a jo dirty joke, you start talking this way to them. If somebody gets around you cussing, you start worshiping God and praising God. That's what I used to do at the football games. At the football game one night, two or three guys sit behind me. They're half drunk. They got the beer. And uh, something happened they didn't like. And they started using God's name in vain. I just jumped up. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. They all got up and moved way down on the other end somewhere. <laughs> you think I'm going to sit there and let the devil curse my God? That's what Goliath was doing, y'all. Goliath was cursing David's God. And he's like, big boy, I don't know who you think you are, but let me tell you something. That sword you got, that 10-foot stature you have, that spear, that shield, that don't mean nothing to me. You see this little old slingshot I got right here? It's got a rock in it. And I want you to know the rock that I serve is going to direct this rock and it's going to take you down. Oh, I know I'm going a long time this morning. Hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. I think this right here will help y'all. As I finish up, I want to tell you a story. Because there's two things, folks, that are absolutely necessary before heaven's authority and power is going to be released in your life. There are two things that are absolutely necessary before heaven's authority and power is released into this earth. You ready? Number one is your faith. Your faith is what gives heaven legal jurisdiction on the earth. Let me say that again. Your faith is what gives heaven legal jurisdiction in this earth. Y'all remember Abraham? The Bible says he was fully persuaded, right? He had faith. He was strong in faith. He was fully persuaded. He was in total agreement with what God said. Did y'all get that? He was in total agreement with what God said. Even though he and his wife was old and barren, but what did God say? No more shall your name be called Abram, but Abraham, why? For I have, past it, I have made you the father of the nation. It's already done. It's a done deal. Amen. So when he said by the stripes of Jesus you were healed, it's a done deal. You were healed, you are healed. No buts, no ifs. That's it, that settles it. Y'all got this? That settles it. But my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's it. That settles it. Don't even think about the economy. Don't think about what's happening in the world. It's, it's done. That's it. I agree with God. Okay? So you've got to have that faith. You've got to be fully persuaded. You've got to be in agreement with heaven, with the Lord. Number two, you've got to confess and act on the kingdom authority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of these things be added to you. What is the kingdom of God? It's God's government on earth. And the kingdom of God is in you. You have the ability to rule and to reign. So the second thing is, you've got to do what Romans 10 says. With the heart believe, with the mouth confess unto. Right? When you do that, you act on that, that, that authority, then things can happen. See, I'm fully persuaded what God says is true. Amen? And I simply speak to release heaven's authority and power into my life, into my body, my finances, into situations. And I can tell y'all a lot, a lot, a lot more stories about how that works. Pastor Gary can see up in Ohio, wrote in one of his books this testimony. There's a woman named Jennifer. Her and her husband started coming to their church. Now, she'd never heard these teachings like you're hearing here today. She'd never heard about healing. She'd never heard about authority. She didn't know these things. When she heard them, she got excited about it. As a matter of fact, she could not get enough. She refused to miss one single service. Week after week, month after month, she took notes. She got CDs. She studied. She started doing everything that the pastor was teaching her to do. Well, on the other hand, her husband, he missed a lot of church. 
And he said a lot of times he had to work, and sometimes it was just other things. He just wasn't there a whole lot, okay? Well, Jennifer got pregnant, and she wanted to have her baby at home. She studied the Word of God. She meditated on the promises of God concerning childbirth. She hired a midwife. She even asked a woman that went to the church there, was a friend of hers. She had had children at home. She asked her to be her coach, her birthing coach. And so the whole time now, she's studying the promises of God. She's confessing the Word. She's fully persuaded that she can have a healthy baby at home. Time for the baby to come. Around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, Pastor Gary's phone rang. He said, I answered the phone, and Jennifer's coach was screaming. Pastor, please pray. The baby has been born dead. The baby had, and he, she said, that the baby had just been taken in the ambulance to the hospital. The EMTs had declared the baby is dead. Well, they jump up, get the clothes on, about 20 minute ride to the hospital. They're praying. His wife, Drenda, all of a sudden, she looked at him and she said, the Lord just told me the baby will be fine. Okay? Y'all better listen to what I'm telling you. She made it. She said, the Lord just told me the baby will be fine. Okay? Now, so they get to the hospital. They walk in the ER. As soon as they walk in, there are seven or eight nurses right there in the lobby. And they're all around this uh, beautiful little baby girl. I mean, she's perfectly normal. She's got good color. She's crying. And so... He said, we looked at them, and every one of them had this look of shock on their face. You, we, you thought they would be smiling with a little baby there. They're all around this baby, and every one of them's got this look of shock on their face. He said, so the lady that had called us, she walks in and again said that the baby had been declared dead by the EMTs at the home. Twenty minutes later, when they arrived at the hospital, the hospital uh, doctors declared the baby dead on arrival, but said suddenly the baby woke up. Another ambulance had transported Jennifer to the hospital, and they put her in the maternity ward, and nobody had informed her at all about the status of her baby. And so Drenda, the pastor's wife, went to the room and walked in. The first thing she said, she said, your baby is fine, and she is just gorgeous. Well, there was a nurse standing beside her bed, and the nurse snapped at Drenda. She said, no, that baby's in a body bag. Well, Drenda said it straight real fast. No, that baby's alive and well. And after that, the baby had no health issues, no brain damage, perfectly normal. Well, the pastor said, I'm one of these people that I like to investigate. I got to find out what happened, how it happened. He said, so I went back to the birthing coach, the lady, and said, now tell me what happened. She said, well, the baby was born. It had no vital signs. She was deep blue in color, and I could not revive her. Now, Jennifer's family, a lot of her member, family members were there, along with her husband, and they began to panic. Immediately, Jennifer spoke up and said, be quiet. She told all of them, be quiet. She called her husband over, she put her finger in his face, and she said, don't you say a word. This baby will be fine. And he kind of act like he didn't know what to say, and she said it again. She said, don't say a word. This baby will be fine. See, she'd been studying. She understood kingdom principles. She didn't want him, as the head of their family, to get in agreement with death and agreement with the bad situation. She needed him. If you can't get in agreement with heaven and with me, then just don't say nothing. And so he just kept his mouth shut. Okay. But I'm telling y'all right now, that declaration is what saved that baby's life. Okay? She understood how important his agreement with her in heaven was. And if you can't get in agreement with me, definitely don't get in agreement with the negative side of things. Okay? Yeah. Whew, I got a new thought. Y'all better write this down. Heaven needs some first responders. I said heaven needs some first responders. Glory, Glory to God. What's your first response? What's your first response going to be? What's your first response going to be? Huh? When they told me I'd had a heart attack and I was going to have all this surgery done, I said, there's nothing wrong with me. You won't find a thing wrong with me. I'm healed. They thought I was nuts. That's my wife. 
They thought I was nuts. The hospital in Monroe and the hospital in Charlotte, they thought I was one of those old religious nuts. But guess what? They couldn't find a thing wrong. Couldn't find a thing wrong, even though all the tests said that my heart had been damaged and I was going to have to have all this surgery, major surgery. I said, you won't find a thing. That's my first response. And I'm telling you all right now, heaven needs a voice. God needs your voice to set things in order in your life. Just because the devil attacks you, he attacks your heart, he attacks your liver, he attacks your lungs, doesn't mean that you have to let him have his way. You've got to stand up, and you've got to decree by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed. I heard about a man this week, Brother Mark told us about it, one of the pastors that support them. He was uh, struck with COVID, and he was in bad shape. And he's sitting there one day, and they're telling him how bad it is, and, you know, I mean, he may die. And all of a sudden, the anointing came on him. His wife said he jumped up out of the chair, and he just shouted out loud, There's too much of the life of God in this body! For a coronavirus to stay. He said immediately the power of God hit him and it all left. Every bit, every symptom left, he was gone. And you've got too much of the life of God in you to put up with anything the devil throws at you. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Ralph, move this for me. Somebody wanted prayer. Somebody's already asked for prayer. But anybody wants prayer, come on down. I tell you, the anointing's here. There's a miracle in the house. Miracles on demand. You come right now. You come believing you're going to receive in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo! Come on, honey, help me. Y'all stretch your hands out. Say it out loud. We believe. Therefore, we speak. We have the spirit of faith. Just like Abraham. Just like David. Just like Paul. We believe in our heart. And we speak with our mouth. We agree with heaven. We're fully persuaded. By the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. We're more than conquerors. We have the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive it right now. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory. Glory. Change, change, change. Change is coming, 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 turning around, turning around. Yeah, it's turning around right now, sister. Turning around. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Oh, the Lord is about to turn some things around in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Just take it, take it, take it. Take what you came for right now. Take it, it's yours. I bind the devil in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I break the power of Satan off of you in the name of Jesus and receive right now everything that God has for you. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. You are a God of restoration. And I just thank you for restoring, restoring everything that's been lost, everything that's been taken in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, be blessed now. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want to ask my brother. Come on up here for a minute. I, I, you have to forgive me. I forgot. I remember Nicole. Our brother here is in the military. He's about to be uh, deployed. Where do you say you're going to be deployed to? Uh, Qatar. Qatar. That's in Iraq or Afghanistan? No, Qatar, that's a, that's, a, that's a nation, right? The little small nation, yeah. Qatar? Q-U-A-T-R or something? Okay, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. Okay. But he's about to be deployed. Uh, and tell me your first name again. Jamie. All right, Jamie, listen. Y'all, I want you to stretch your hands out. And Jamie, I want you to do this. I want you to read Psalm 91 every morning. Every single day until you come home. You hear me? Because the angels of God will encamp around you to protect you. The blood of Jesus will be upon you. You're overcome by the word of the, the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. And you read it out loud. Amen. And you say, this is me. I'm under the shadow of the Almighty. His wings are over me to keep me in all my ways. The angels of the Lord are surrounding me. Amen? Amen? Let me tell you something. George Washington was a man of God. And when George Washington would be riding on his horse and leading his soldiers. Indians were trained to shoot the rifles, and some of them became sharpshooters. And they were given specific instructions. You take the man down that's on that white horse. He would have holes in his hat. 
He would have holes in his shirt, his jacket, but not one bullet ever touched him. And it became known among the Indians, you cannot kill that man. He's protected by the gods. You are protected by one God, our God. Amen. Y'all stretch your hands. Father, oh, thank you, Lord. Right now, Father God, we just praise you for a shield about our brother. We plead the blood of Jesus over him, Lord, as they go forth in service to you and to this nation. We thank you, Father God, for divine protection. Nothing by any means shall harm him. No weapon formed against him shall prosper, for he overcomes by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. We cover him with the blood of Jesus. Oh, we apply the blood to his spirit, soul, and body. We thank you, Father God, that your angels are assigned to him to protect him. Your spirit leading him and guiding him. He will hear a voice say, turn here, go there. And as he follows, Lord, I thank you, Father God, that you are with him. Oh, Lord, we pray for his wife and his children as he is deployed, Lord. We agree to be here as a family, to be with her, with them, and to help in any way we can. We want him to know, Lord, that she is not here by herself, that we are a phone call away. And we're so thankful, Lord Jesus, that you are only a voice away. All we have to do is say, Jesus, Jesus, in faith, and you are there. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Love you, brother. God bless you. Hallelujah. I tell you, the Lord is good. Amen. Whoo, hallelujah. Oh, I just sense the anointing of God just standing there talking and praying over him. Hallelujah.